Welcome to Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Planting the seed of truth and growing families in the Word of God. So last week we, we covered that we covered walking with God and listen, and that nearness is the fulfillment. Nearness to God is the answer for fulfillment and satisfaction. And I, I'm going to say this. Everyone in the world wants fulfillment and wants satisfaction. Yeah, it's true. That's right. the, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. We're designed to be whole, That's right? Good. We're designed to be whole. We're not designed to be partial. We're not designed to be empty. We're, we were designed for wholeness. And when sin entered the world, deception entered the world with it. That's the sin entered the world through deception. And the enemy wants to deceive you. And if he can deceive you, he can take you out. So how, how do we get deceived in terms of fulfillment. This is a little bit of review, some add-on. We're going to jump into what we're going to talk about this morning here in a minute, but I want to cover this real quick. I feel like the Holy Spirit's wanting to do this. We get deceived into, into thinking that fulfillment and satisfaction is our job. And if you believe that you are to fulfill yourself, or if you believe that you are to satisfy yourself, you're opening the door to be deceived, which then opens the door to compromise. And 100% of the world's problems today is because of compromise. Any issue within our government, it's because of mankind's moral failures. Any issue in our towns, any issue in our homes, it comes down to character and it comes down to compromise. Well, what leads us into compromise? It's maybe I'm trying to fill something in my life that I'm not designed to fill on my own. Good. So when I say f nearness to God is the answer for fulfillment and satisfaction, that's because he's the only one that can fulfill us and he's the only one that can satisfy us. It's his word in us that brings us into new life. It's, his, it's, it's the Holy Spirit in us that satisfies our deepest desire and our deepest longings. And what happens is whenever we try to go and chase after those things ourselves, we begin, we get tired. We get worn out. We get disappointed. We get burnt out. And the Lord did not design our lives to be ho-hum. He designed our lives to be fulfilled and satisfied. So last week I said this, the right, a right fear of the Lord will produce nearness to God. If we say we fear the Lord, yet we don't come close and expose ourselves, we fear exposure rather than God. And it's nearness and exposure, that's what we need. You need to be close and you need to be exposed before him. So we're going to travel further down the road of walking with God. And I want to address things that might keep us at a distance from him. Good. Or keep us at a distance from what he has for us and what the kingdom of God is designed to look like in our life. And praise God, we are raised and, and we are taught here that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? Yes. And that you don't have to earn your way into this. But I want us to really dive into the root causes and I, don't, I want us to let go. We're going we're gonna to let go of the fear of needing to perform for God yeah. and the fear of inadequacy yeah. and the fear of never being good enough. Yeah. And this, the fear of feeling like we need to perform for God or the feeling of never being good enough for God is not something that just affects people of young age. It affects people from, through all generations. When, listen, when we walk close with God, we gain the revelation of how he sees us and how he thinks towards us. Jeremiah 29, 11. Let's just hit a few verses here. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. 
Okay, so he has plans that are good for us. Amen? Do you receive that? Yes. Okay, so then let's go to Matthew. chapter. We're going to be flipping real fast here. So if you just want to listen, that's A. Okay. Go to Matthew chapter 6. Start in verse 24. Uh, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be to, devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Verse 25, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For your heavenly father feeds them and, they, and aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry, verse 28, I'm in, the new, I'm in the New Living Translation. And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lily of the fi- lilies of the fields and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonder- wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So we see that God cares about us. And let's go to 1 Peter 5, 7. First Peter 5, 7 says this, starting in verse 6. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Say this, the Father Father cares about me. me. So we're going to look into the life of Jesus. And we have to know this, is that Jesus is the perfect representation of who God is. He said this, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So if you can't find it in Christ, it's not in the Father. And if it's in Christ, it's in the Father. And oftentimes you would see in scripture where Jesus would correct the Israelites on how God was. You say this, but I say this. Here's an example. He said, you, you say that it is, a, is, is it, a, wow, okay. <laughs> uh, you say it's a sin to commit adultery, right? That's what he said. You say that. And then Jesus said this. I say, if you look at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. He would tell, we're going to jump into the prodigal son later. He would tell stories about, he would tell the story of the prodigal son and reveal to the, to the children of Israel, to the Jewish population of how God was and the way that he was. And I imagine they were really shocked because they firmly believed God was angry. And if you believe God's angry, you will never get close to someone you think hates you. And God can hate the thing. God doesn't hate you. You know, we say the phrase, love the sinner, hate the sin. I want to refine that a little bit. God doesn't hate you. He hates the thing that keeps you distant from him. And when we allow compromise to come into our lives, we are putting a block up and we are putting a barrier up from the very thing that will give us what we think we're trying, what we think we're getting through compromise. I'm going to say that again. When we allow compromise to to take over our life, sin to take over our life, we are putting up a barrier between us and the father. And it's the father that gives us the very thing that we're trying to get on our own in the sin that we're living in. So Jesus is the perfect, perfect representation of the Father. And this is what today is not. Today's message is not a do what you want and it's okay message. If, you, if we desire lawlessness and we desire sin and we don't deny, desire nearness to God, if we want our own way and our own path and don't believe that the lifestyle will produce, listen, if we want our own way and our own path, don't believe that the, that lifestyle will produce the fruit of a life that's walking with God. You want peace, you want joy, you want fulfillment, you want satisfaction. And, but here's what's, here's the, can I, I'm going to dive into this. Here's the deception of compromise. It gives you all of those things instantly. 
Sin makes our flesh feel good. It does. Being rebellious feels fantastic. It feels, I mean, it's, it's, it's fun for a moment. Yeah. Right. Teenagers, being disobedient to your parents, hiding those little things, and it's exciting <laughs> until you get caught. And I, here's what I've come to learn is that, especially in, in younger years, most of our sin is not because we wanted to sin, it's because we wanted to rebel. So young people, listen to me. You're not, I'm gonna, oh wow, I'm gonna get real pastoral here. <laughs> you're not some hot stuff because you're doing the things you shouldn't. Right. You're foolish. That's yep, true. That's true. And I love you. Yeah. And if your parents are raise you, raising you up in a godly home, you're, you're despising the very thing that will give you what you want. Good word. But our social media and culture today has tricked us into thinking that we've got to be like the world to enjoy life. Here's what Proverbs says. Sin is pleasurable for a season. That may not be Proverbs, but it's in the, it's in the Bible. <laughs> The word, I'll say this, the word says sin is pleasurable for a season. Proverbs says this, there is a way that seems right to man, but in the end there is death. And, uh, and, and I remember when I was 18 through about 25, I was really dumb. But I thought I knew everything. And I want you guys to know this, young people. A little bit of humility will take you a long way in life. So true, Dylan. So true. Pride will get you nowhere. All right. Amen. Let's move on to how God loves us. All right. <laughs> Let's go to Romans chapter 8, verse 15. I'm going to read it out of the Passion Translation if you have a device. So if you have a King James, it's going to sound nothing like what you have. Romans 8, verse 14. The mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. And you did not receive the spirit of religious duty, leading you back into the fear of never being good enough. But you have received the spirit of full acceptance, enfolding you into the family of God. And you will never feel orphaned, for as he rises up within us, our spirits join him in saying the words of tender affection, beloved father, or Abba, father. For the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us as he whispers into our innermost being, you are God's beloved child. And since we are his true children, we qualify. This is kind of a lot of what I talked about last week. And since we are his true children, we qualify to share all his treasures, for indeed we are heirs of God himself. And since we are joined to Christ, we also inherit all that he, he is and all that he has. We will experience, I talked about this last week, we will experience being co-glorified with him, provided that we accept his sufferings as our own. And that sufferings as our own is not you suffering now, it's you joining with him in his resurrection. In his death. You join with him in his death. You join with him in his burial. You join with him in his resurrection. You join with him in his glorification. So provided that you accept his sufferings as your own, that's another way of saying we die to ourselves and we are made new in Christ. Amen? So we have received the spirit that tells us that we can let go of the fear of never being good enough. Today's message is for those of you who think you need to live life on the outskirts of faith. And, and listen, this, my words are very intentional here. And until you get your life to right, you can't be close to God. Well, here's the problem with that. You and your. And as we begin to go deeper and our roots tap further into him, we have to let go of lies and deception that have been told to us or said about us. There are some things that have been spoken over you that you need to let go of. 
well, you're always this. You're just, you know, some of y'all, you're just hard to this. You're hard to that. You're always be this way. Cut those things loose and let's move on into new life. All too often, the things we believe about ourselves are not true and have either come from a religious system or people that have spoken lies over us. So here's what we have to do in our lives, church. We have to draw the line. You can love someone and care about someone and reject what is spoken over you. You can reject what is not true about you. If what someone says over you does not line up with the word, let it go. Mm. you've been made new. Say this, I've been been made new. new. So let's go to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 11. Second Corinthians five, verse 11. Let's skip down. We're going to read verse 16. Actually, no, we'll just start in verse 11. I want to read the whole thing. Second Corinthians five, verse 11, because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord. We have, we work hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere. And I hope you know this too. Are we commending ourselves to you again? No. We are giving you a reason to be proud of us so you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart. (laughs) If it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. Verse 14, either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. Verse 16. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. See, to understand who you are in Christ and to understand how God thinks about you, how he sees you, how how he feels about you, I'll, I'll just say that. You have to stop evaluating others and yourself from our human point of view. We have to change the way that we see. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view, how differently we know him now. Verse 17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. So whenever you come into, whenever we come into Christ and we draw near to him, there is a renewal. There is a regeneration of our spirit. And I believe it goes down to our very human DNA of who we are. So the things that once held you captive have no power and authority over you. Maybe you were born with an addictive mindset. Maybe you were, maybe, maybe you were born with a drive to rebel against authority or rebel against God that doesn't control you anymore. Maybe we were born to be addicted to lust or maybe, maybe you've struggled with pornography in the past. And I want you to know today, our, our struggles past and present are not excuses to keep us from his presence. And if you allow the things you've done or the thing you did to keep you from, the, from him, he is the only one who can actually free you from what's holding you captive. He is the only one. Christ is the only one. It's the Holy Spirit being made alive in you that doesn't just change what you do. Honestly, God is not interested in behavioral correction. And if you've been told that you need to get it figured out and you need to to measure up before you can get near to him, that's a lie. You need to quit believing that. Because the measuring up and the figuring it out only happens with him. You have not received a spirit that has made you fearful slaves. You have not received, you have, we have not received a spirit. We have not received the spirit of never being good enough. Oh man, we are accepted in Christ. So let's, let's just 
break this down. Here's what happens. We fall, we fail, we make mistakes. We find ourselves trapped in an addiction. We look, we look at pornography. We lust. We lie. We sin. What you do in that moment is essential. How you respond to your failure is where the rubber meets the road. And it all hinges on how you think you're supposed to approach God. It all hinges on how you think you're supposed to approach God. Now, why, why am I diving into this? Because it, this ties into our faith. How will we ever ask God for what we need if we don't believe he likes us? How will, we, how will we pray for healing in our body or for someone else's body if we don't feel like we're good enough to even be close to the healer? So this directly ties into our walk of faith. This directly ties into how you talk and how you do and how you think. We're getting into the roots today. Is that okay? Living out the glorified life of you've been co-crucified, co-buried, co-resurrected, you're co-glorified, Romans Romans 8 covers that clearly. Living out the glorified life is not marked by how well we perform for God. It's marked by our attitude. And especially our attitude after we fall. If you, have, if you believe you have to perform to earn his approval, you will hold back from fully drawing close to him. We have to understand that it's only his presence and his nearness that can actually heal, heal the root cause of our compromise. Proverbs 24, verse 16, the godly man, the godly may trip seven times, but they will get back, get up again. Amen. If you quit walking, you won't walk with God. But I tripped and fell, Dylan, get up, put one foot in front of the other, go again. I'm ministering to someone this morning, come on. Get up, put one foot in front of the other. And go again. I'm going to quote Pastor Susan. Grow anyways. Yes. Grow anyways. The sin in our lives is only broken when we get close. The sin in our lives is only broken when we get close to him. So rather than, listen, we have to change how we think. Rather than living to not sin, we, get, we live to get close and trust him. When we get close, he gives us his mind. You've been given the mind of Christ. When you get close, he gives you his mind and his perspective. And here's what happens. He, here's the goal in our walk with God. It's, it's for sin to become distasteful. And a lot of times we're trying to willpower our way to freedom. And you don't need to willpower your way to freedom. You need to get on your face and get in the secret place your way to freedom. You're trying to white knuckle an addiction. You're going to fall back into the addiction. You're trying to white knuckle. We're trying to white knuckle having speaking the word over our life. You don't white. Listen, you don't white knuckle anything in the kingdom. It's, it's a gift. He reveals things to us. He, he, he doesn't reward us for what we do. He reveals those who get close. He reveals things to those who get close to him. But we think that, oh man, I just, I failed this week. I did something wrong. I'm going to, I'm going to skip church this Sunday. So I don't go look like a hypocrite. I would rather someone be in here and be a hypocrite and get, and get wrecked by the Holy Spirit than stay distant outside. <clears throat> you know, what's sad is a lot of these lies that have kept people in addiction come from religious systems. <clears throat> the goal is for sin let's, let's be specific the sin that has so easily tripped us up the, soul, the goal is not for us to say I don't sin anymore it's to go that is disgusting yeah. we, we need to change how we look at it when we draw near to God Sin becomes distasteful because we've tasted of what his presence has to offer. See, he doesn't, he doesn't just leave us empty. He's not saying, okay, die to yourself and step into nothing. 
He says, die to yourself and step into fullness of life. Because if we are trying to find fullness of life and compromise, yet it's death, then obviously real fullness of life is in, in the kingdom. It's with Jesus. So if we're going to find fullness of life, we have to step into it. And you can't think that you need to live in this in-between phase before you can do this. Because if you live in the in-between phase, then you're just going to fall right back into it. The goal is that we don't have to engage sin to realize it's bad. I don't have to fall to realize, oh, I messed up. He wants to give you us the eyes to see if I do this, the end result's going to be this. Here's some wisdom, young folk. I'm a youth pastor. I just do this. So welcome. <laughs> my, I, my dad would always ask, I would say, hey, dad, can I go do this? And rather than being met with a yes or a no, I'd be met with about 15 questions. And I loved it. Well, not really. I hated it. <laughs> But what my dad was teaching me was, I want you to fully think about what you're going to do. Where's it going to end up? Where's it going to lead to? And a lot of times we've lived life floating through life with no clear vision, with no idea where we're going, no idea what we're doing. I'm just going to go hang out with these friends and we're going to see what happens. You better not. I'm just going to go hang out with these friends. We're just going to have a good time. I'm not really sure. Well, if your good time turns into a compromised time, you might want to think about where you're heading to. I didn't know that these people were going to do that. Yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah, you did. I didn't know we were going to end up doing this. I didn't know we were going to end up doing drugs. Yeah, you did. <laughs> okay, let's be real. Have a vision, young people. Have a vision. Think about where you're going. You know, a lot of times we, we get deceived into thinking that compromise is fun, and it's never fun. The end result's never fun. And we have to value honoring God in every, every situation rather than being scared of getting caught. And there's a lot of, and I've, listen, I'm speaking from experience. I've been sorry, not because I thought what I did was wrong. I've been sorry because I got caught doing wrong. And there's a great difference. And that all has to do with this heart right here. We have to realize the end result of sin and we have to see what it really is because when we are close to him and so submitted to him, we see it his way. We need to see everything in our life through his eyes. We need to get to the place when you draw near to God. Oh, this is about overcoming sin, walking with God. The thought of sinning, when you get close to him, the thought of sinning grieves us instead of excites us. That space only happens when we walk close with him every day. And when we walk by faith. Let's go to John 15. So let's kind of back up and we're going to kind of wrap what I just set up. If you want to overcome sin in your life, you don't need to go figure out how to get, it, get yourself clean. You need to get to the one who will make you clean. Amen? Okay, let's go to John 15. Um, we're going to start in verse 1. <clears throat> oh man, I'm excited about this. So John 15 verse one, I'm the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit. So they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. If you believe that you have to go distance yourself from God before you can draw near to God, you're severing yourself from the very thing that will produce fruit in your life. Right. Remain in me. Verse four again, remain in me and I will remain in you for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, 
You may ask for anything you want, and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. This is not to scare us into fruit, scare us about not bearing fruit. Because here's the reality. Sometimes we go through seasons of life where we are not bearing the fruit we think we should. And just because we have a season of fruitlessness doesn't mean that we are going to be cut off. Because I think it's very important of what he does, of, of his distinguishing in verse 5 and verse 6. He only throws away the branches that don't remain in him. He doesn't throw away the branches that have moments of fruitlessness. He, because if you have a moment, let's look at it like this. Sometimes branches have little offshoots. And what he does in our life, when we are in a season where we're not bearing the fruit that we think we should, or we're coming out of a season of, of, of addiction or compromise, or we're, we're thinking that we need to distance ourselves from God, get ourselves cleaned up before we can go back to him, or we need to act like we have it all figured out, or you're living under this relentless pressure to look like you have it all together. You don't have to do that. You need to abide in him and let him cut away the things that aren't fruitful. We don't need to distance ourselves from, from the Father. We do not self-prune. You do not hold the shears. The Father holds the pruning shears. And we have been conditioned to believe that I need to cut off the things that aren't fruitful in my life. No, you bring it to the Father. He cuts off the things that aren't fruitful in your life. Not so you can be pain, so you can then grow a new shoot and bear good fruit. But if you are fearful of the pruning shears and you're fearful of the father, because you know what his pruning shears are? Grace. But if we, if, don't fear the pruning shears, church. Fear never being connected. We don't, don't fear the pruning shears. The closer you get to him, the more he molds us, the more he shapes us, the more he prunes us. And I'm telling you right now, more than ever, we need pruning in our lives. Maybe, because when, listen, when he prunes us, he actually gets to the root of the issue. Maybe the root of your addiction is not just wanting to do things that you shouldn't do. Maybe it's a wound from your past, from your childhood. He gets to the root cause of things. Maybe, maybe the reason that we're constantly on our phones and we mindlessly scroll and we're addicted to this thing and the next thing we know, we land on a page with pornography on it. Maybe he cuts off the branch that doesn't bear fruit, not so that we won't look at pornography, but so we'll engage with the people around us yeah. and we'll engage with him in the secret place. He cuts off the real thing that's causing fruitlessness. Much of the church is conditioned to believe that you have to get it together before you can abide. Here's why that's wrong. It takes a gospel and places our performance as the means of access, not his free gift of grace. Come boldly before the throne of grace. It says, come boldly before the throne of grace. I, my little, almost two-year-old girl walks boldly up to me. She has a strut about her that I don't know where she got it. She's got to walk. And when she sees her mom or her dad, that little girl goes running. And that's the exact heart that we should have to God. Abba Father. And she doesn't like put on the brakes before she gets to me. I am the brakes. She just runs into me. And how often are you trying to pump the brakes before you get close to God rather than just slamming into his grace, church? Slam into the grace of God. Quit trying to, oh, I, just, I didn't do right this week. It doesn't matter. Get close to him. Mm. God is less interested in your immediate performance correction rather than he is with getting your heart that will lead to long-term fruitfulness. Yes. We are addicted to short-term gains in our country, mm -hmm. in our culture. 
We, are, we, we treat the kingdom of God like a McDonald's drive through If I don't have my double quarter pounder with cheese in five seconds after I order it, I'm honking the horn and I'm mad. And if my microwave, you know, we, we, the microwave thing, I, you know, the microwave is great, but I would rather have a, I don't want a microwave steak. I, that's terrible. If you microwave a steak, don't invite me. Love you. Don't call me over. <laughs> the only way we're going to get right with him is to get close with him. You can let go of the fear of never being good enough. He's made you right with him. The Lord has, given, has not given ourselves access to the pruning shears. Only the Father carries them. Only the Father carries the pruning shears. When the Father prunes us, He deals with all of it. He deals with all of it. And it's only nearness to God that shapes us and molds us into the image of Christ. See, that's what we're called to be, church, is image bearers in the kingdom of God. God's called you to walk in a level of authority in this world. He's called you to walk in a level of, of freedom in this world. And the only way you're going to access those things, the realness of those things, is getting close with him. And you cannot be, sit back and constantly think that, oh, I didn't earn it this week. I didn't do well enough this week. No, you gotta, we have to cut loose of the performance mindset. We have to cut loose the fear of never being good enough. The kingdom, the kingdom of God is very much opposite to our, to our American culture of being self-made. You are not self-made in the kingdom of God. We take a lot of pride in doing things ourselves, and I get that. I'm not, I'm not opposed to that. Go to work, build your business, do what you gotta do, be an entrepreneur, but when it comes to the kingdom, humble yourself. Because you cannot make yourself out into who you're called to be. Only he can. Your performance, our performance, is not what gets us close. And our performance is not what's going to get us close. Us being good enough on our own is not what's gonna give us access Listen, the Father already desires that everyone would come unto, come unto him. There's no prerequisite for nearness to God. There's no prerequisite for nearness to God. And if one is going to draw close to God, you have to understand that he's never looking down on us and he's never condem condemning us. He just wants us close to him. Go to Luke 15. We're going to look at the story of the prodigal son. Are you getting something this morning? Good. Praise God. Go to Luke 15. We're going to start in verse 11. Um, this is a beautiful story of the father's heart. And it's very easy to misunderstand this story because you look at it as, you know, the, the old, here's the reality. Both sons thought their performance was going to get them something. So let's, let's dive into this. A man has two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his two sons. A few days later, the younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About, that, about the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land. And he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am, dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer wor worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as your hired servant. That was his whole spiel. He's ready to tell his dad about how he's bad and messed up, and I, I'm not worthy of being a son. I'm going to be your hired servant. And you know, a lot of times we think of ourselves that way. I'm not worthy, worthy of being your son, God. I'm just a hired servant. You are not a hired servant. You're a son. Let's keep going. 
So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son and embraced him and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. You know, how often have we told God, I'm not worthy of being your son? I'm not worthy. Mm, nope. But his father said to his servants, notice the father never addressed his false identity. The father never addressed the distance that the son placed between him and the father. He said, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger, sonship identity, and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf we've been fattening. We must, we must celebrate with a feast. For the son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So the party began. So the younger son believed he had to earn his way back to the father. Let's go look at the older son. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I've slaved for you. And you never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fatted calf. Verse 31, his father said to him, look, dear son, you've always stayed by me. Everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. It's never our performance that gives us access to him. And just as the younger son thought he had to earn his way back to the father, the older son thought he had to earn his father's approval. And it was the older, son, older son's view of himself and the view of the father that kept him from being close to the father. Because notice where the older son was. He was in the field working. I've, I've gone to church my whole life. I've done all the right things. God, why, why would you let this happen? In my, I've done all the right things. Your performance is not on God's radar. Us working our way into the kingdom will get us nowhere. And the older son thought his work had earned him a position with the father. He Listen, but here's the reality. He thought it earned him a position with the father that he already had. The father already wanted him close. The son thought he had to earn it. Just like the younger son. He thought he had to earn his way back into the kingdom. This really applies to both areas of our life because we, I've grown up in church my whole life. I've been here my whole life. Praise God, I love it. I wouldn't change it for the world. I can be tricked into thinking that every time I get on stage and play drums and every time I'm in youth serving or every time I do this or every time I do that, I'm working for God and I'm, I'm earning his some level of approval. I don't do anything in the house. I don't do anything in the world for the kingdom of God to earn his approval. I do it because he's already approved of me. Everything we listen, everything you do for the kingdom, I'm trying this, I'm teaching you how to avoid burnout. Everything you do for the kingdom of God needs to be an overflow from your walk with God. If you make serving God the means in which you access him, you'll never get close because he's already called you come near to me. We do not do things for the kingdom because we've earned it we, or because we're trying to earn something. We do things for the kingdom because he so radically changed our lives. There's an order to this and it's not you getting it right first. It's you getting close to him first. It's never, the, it's never our performance. It's never you being good enough that gives us you access to him. It's his heart towards us. Both the younger brother and the older brother thought they had to earn his approval. The father just wanted them with them. He wants us to come in meekness, not in pride in ourselves. To try to earn his acceptance is an inflation of oneself. We first humble ourselves. And real humility is believing what God has said about you, not what you think about yourself. Living every day, 
meditating on his word, going to the secret place, living a life of prayer, having time with the Lord, all of that's actually way more simpler than we make it out to be. We just get really distracted. Every Sunday morning, my screen time notification pops up on my iPhone and I wince. I'm like, oh, oh. Because that's, that's just a meter of how much time I wasted in my day. And getting close with God is not some pious thing that we do of like, I've got to get on my, if you want to get on your knees, you can. But oftentimes I've had the most radical encounters with God when I was full-time electrician working for Todd, making up a switch box. The next thing I know, I'm making up, up a switch box and crying. <laughs> When you're in the car driving to work, when you're doing dishes, doing laundry, when you're, work, when you're doing whatever you're doing, set your mind on, I'm with you. I'm, this, I'm, I'm doing this with you. Meet me here, Lord. Show me what you want to show me. On our way to our young people, when you're at school, whenever you're walking through the halls, you can be praying as you walk through the halls. Lord, I just pray peace over the school right now. I thank you that you see me and you know me. When you're out in the deer stand hunting, what a time to meet with God. There is no space. We have to, we cannot put a divide in our lives between spiritual and secular. It's, it's just all spiritual. It's all kingdom. He can meet you wherever you want to be met at. If Jesus, the God-man, hid himself to be with the Father, shouldn't we also? Yes. You can go through these Gospels and you can see countless time and time and time again where Jesus went away to be with the Father. Because yep. he only knew, he knew this, the only place he's going to be shown who his Father is is with him. Yep. And the only place you're going to be shown who the Father is is with the Father. Here's, we, all too often we immerse ourselves in the culture of the world around us and just dip our toes into the kingdom and wonder why we don't see the fruit we are looking for. We need to reverse that. You need to immerse yourself in the kingdom and then go bring the kingdom into the culture in which you're in. Go to Luke chapter 10 and I'm going to be done. Closing number one, so if I do a second closing or a third closing, I'm up there with John. But if I just get this one closing in, uh, you're welcome, guys. Love y'all. It's not performance, it's nearness. We're going to look at Mary and Martha, Luke 10, verse 38. Luke 10, verse 38. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered into a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. Huh. She's serving the Lord. Jesus is there to eat. And Martha was, Martha was not thinking wrong in terms of wanting to be excellent for the Lord. She just thought it was her serving him that was the better thing. So that's not what the scripture says. I'll keep reading. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. Martha's like, listen here, Jesus. <laughs> you need to tell Mary to quit being lazy. You need, to, you need to tell Mary to get into high gear. We got work to do. I got a roast and I got green beans and I got casserole to make. And she's sitting here just at your feet being lazy. We laugh, but how many? How? Yeah. No. If you put your identity in what you do for him, you'll miss your identity in him. Oh, that was really good. So I'm going to say it again. If you miss, you, 
if you try to find your identity in doing things for God, you will completely miss your identity in God. Verse 41, but the Lord answered to her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. So I would say her busyness was fruit of internal restlessness. Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. We have not, we've not been called to impress God with how well we can do things for him. We've been called to humble ourselves at his feet and get close to him and just walk with him every day. Walk with God every day. Because here's, here's the reality. He's not after our performance. He is after our heart. And whenever, we, and whenever our hearts are totally submitted to God, that's when you start to see you doing the right things. That's when the performance comes into play. Because, yes, we're, we're not just called to give into our carnal nature, but we're also called, we're, we're not called to give into our carnal nature. We're called to be, to be given a new nature. And you only find the new nature with Christ. It's there in nearness to God that we find the thing we've been searching for all along. True freedom. No pressure to perform. Cut loose from the fear of never being good enough or never measuring up. But, to pow- but, but the power to fully walk out this life that we're called to. You have access to the power to do what God has called you to do. You don't have to muster it up on your own. You are filled with the Holy Spirit. You are filled with power from on high. Walking with God is an everyday thing. It's an everyday thing. Y'all stand with me. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. We pray that this message has uplifted, encouraged, and motivated you today. You can find us online at rccenter.org or visit us at 305 Lakefront Drive, Russellville, Arkansas.